Well, first one historical note that the, the revelation of St. John the Divine is not a unique phenomenon in the Judeo Christian tradition. It's in a succession of apocalyptic books which abounded around the time of Christ because many people believed that the end was literally at hand. St. John the Baptist's message was repent for the end is at hand. It was a period very similar to our own in the sense that the idea of the end being at hand was widely believed, only too credible to them for whatever their reasons were. Mm. The, the book of Daniel in the Old Testament is an apocalyptic prophet, prophetic book and is a precursor of the... Um, Revelation of St. John the Divine. These are just two examples in a large and extensive literature. It pervades the teachings of Jesus, this apocalyptic sense of um, the, the changing of everything. So, <clears throat> um, where was I? Uh, about Daniel. Oh yes, pervades Daniel, that it pervades the thing and it, it pervades, it, it comes very early on because the promise of the, to Abraham, it starts with Abraham. Um, God promises Abraham that he'll take him and his descendants to another land. He'll give them a land. There's a promise of a land where wonderful things will happen. Abraham's children shall be as the sands of the sea, and he shall be the father of many nations. And these are promises about things that haven't happened but will happen. And through faith in these promises, history is made. And there's a passage in the 11th chapter of the Epistle to the Hebrews, which is in the New Testament, a, a doctrine to Jewish Christians. And there's a whole sermon on faith, how the entire motor of history for the Jewish people was this faith in what they hadn't yet seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the passage begins. And by faith Abraham went out to find a strange land, not having seen it, or even glimpsed it afar off. By faith Moses, Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt to the promised land. And then uh, by faith Noah built the ark, knowing not for what or when. And so when the rains came, he'd already built this ark and everyone else was drowned and he and his family took off. All these things are done by faith and it ends with this thing about how um, the, we, we are moving by faith towards a new state, a promised land. Um, uh, because if we belong to the cities of the world as we know them, we'd go back to those cities, but we're moving onwards. And it ends with that famous passage, we are strangers and pilgrims in this land. So there's this sense of being on a journey through time towards some destiny in the future, which can be a different place like America. The Pilgrim Fathers were inspired by this mythology to come to America and see in it a new promised land. It's inspired the migratory urges of the Northern Europeans for, for centuries now, this vision. Um, and it's also inspired the attempt to change the world through science and technology, but it's so deeply rooted in the Judeo-Christian tradition, that mere tampering with the book of Revelation won't make it go away. It's fundamental to the entire historical orientation of the religion. We need to direct it toward a uh, non-lethal, satisfying conclusion. Well, the momentum can't be... I don't think the momentum of the technological effects of all this can be stopped. Or at least but certainly not uh, in a short... considering this possibility that I mentioned at the beginning now, which is that there is this intuition is of something profound, that it isn't simply a lethal neurosis. It's the actual anticipation of what is now made inevitable by all this technology. Well, in that case, there's no problem. No, well, I'm, I'm not We're not sure going to reject the inevitable. We just, as you said, suggested, sort of like, get used to it happening. <laughs> <laughs> well, get used to the fact it could happen at any time. You see, Terence is so much like St. John, in, in, in both in his St. John the Baptist form and, and in St. John the Divine. Um, there's, in, in the Gospels, there's these passages of Jesus which Terence could easily quote and add to his armamentarium of, is this uh, Nicodemus, what Christ told Nicodemus? No, it's his prophecies in St. Luke's Gospel about how the, when the kingdom of heaven comes, when like it will be, it'll be a, like a thief in the night. And, you know, in the parable of the, of the seven wise and foolish virgins who mm. are not ready for the end, many stories that say that, you know, when it comes, it'll come suddenly and you won't know when it's coming. And um, yes, you have like to live peace in the night, and no man will know the moment of my coming. Well, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm yielding now to Terence's view that there's no way to save this vehicle. That the the, the, the basic scriptures are 
riddled with a self-fulfilling prophecy of apocalypse. And either there is an inevitable apocalypse on the horizon, or in case there's not, one might be created by the self-fulfilling prophecy, the, the mechanism of paranoid delusion, then um, w w we would have to uh, defuse the time bomb of the Bible. That's a good way of thinking. Yes. And I the mean, Koran. People should be allowed to let the apocalypse happen, not make it happen. Yeah. Which we, if, if culture is a fantasy coming out of the unconscious, then you know we have uh, set ourselves up for this. It's now going to be very delicate to, to ride this through, understand it, stop it, back out, so integrate the, it. The, uh, the myth of apocalypse, is this then one of the major weaknesses of this system from the evolutionary point of view? It's what enabled us to understand and discover the evolutionary point of view. The evolutionary point of view is the apocalyptic vision of history writ large, surely. I mean, the very fact that the notion of human progress human made people... progress requires the beginning, the middle, and the end to mm. even gawk it. Yes. And the All thing right. is that from the idea of human progress, which was widespread by the end of the 18th century, the idea of biological progress, i.e. the same process recognized in the human realm but extended to all life, was seemed increasingly plausible to many people because the idea of hu life as totally static and the whole of nature as utterly frozen, with only humans developing in this mode. You see, when Hegel showed the dialectical development of thought, it was a fairly obvious uh, idea that Marx and others took up of thinking of a kind of evolutionary development of matter as well. In other words, seeing the evolutionary process as not just a human one, but involving all life, and then since 1966, the entire cosmos with Big Bang cosmology. So I would say that the Big Bang cosmology, which is an apocalyptic vision of history with an explosive beginning and uh, therefore implying an explosive end, is simply a projection, well, I shouldn't say simply, but is a kind of projection of this Judeo-Christian model of history. It's not just confined to churches and synagogues. It's something which has come to, right. it's the myth which encloses our entire scientific worldview, yes. which has grown up within this Judeo-Christian matrix. Yes. And it started no, in the no, human realm, then it spread to... Apocalyptarian. <laughs> good, good. It seems inevitable. <laughs> it is inevitable. Get used to it. <laughs> but you see, the evolutionary view gives us um, a sort of vast time scale for this process. It basically, it's still in the same model. It says, sooner or later, maybe in five, maybe ten billion years, our sun will explode. It will follow the course of a grade three star or whatever it's classified Not as. That we know what the course is. <laughs> but <laughs> the typical course of such a star, we say airily, having observed stars for uh, a few, a few um, years. A few years. <laughs> <laughs> yes. years careful observation. And big supernovas that tell us what happens when a star blows, over, uh, blows up are things that we've observed occasionally. You know, like one in 1987. Anyway, so the theory is, it's just a star. It will, like any other star, burn out. It'll either become a red giant or a black hole. I've forgotten which it'll become. But at any rate, that's the, that's the end for us. So the scientific worldview actually does have the same thing. It has, I think, the star, sun becoming a supernova or a red giant and ex uh, killing everything in the solar system. That would be our end. And it would be one that mirrored the Big Bang as a kind of incandescent beginning. That's the scientific view. That is yeah. an apocalyptic view. It's just, a few years. But it's just that it transfers the apocalypse to the remote future. Conveniently so that far you don't, away. You don't have to, it doesn't get rid of it. Yeah. It, it, it has it, and the heat death of, of the old thermodynamic 19th century universe, the steam engine running out of steam, was a kind of slow but inevitable ending of time. The heat death of the cosmos was when entropy was at a maximum and processes work and that kind of thing came to an end. And so it was a kind but, of... But you see, so now that we're down to this, we're accepting the uh, apocalypse myth because it's an integral part of the historical concept as the Israelites invented it. And we can't do anything about that. And um, ne nevertheless, this has no implication at all as to the overall longevity of our human habitation on Earth. No, I disagree. I so think therefore, a the paranoia of our culture is manifest in the assumption that it's happening tomorrow.
Except that there's ample evidence. It isn't paranoia. Who else evidence. has nuclear stockpiles? Who else has agent orders? Who else bad. has CFCs dissolving yes. the ozone hole? This is not paranoia. Paranoia? The earth is on fire. Haven't you heard? There's no reason to worry about being too paranoid. You can lift your yeah. foot <laughs> off that pedal. It's okay. <laughs> you can go with that intuition now. The no, planet the, is on fire. To, f to fasten the fire to a com complete um, incineration in a certain year, no matter what the response. No, that's not what's being said. You can interpret it as the smeared apocalypse that takes 200 years but still ends with everybody dead at the end of it, or the fast apocalypse that takes 15 minutes and could happen today or tomorrow. There are all these styles of imagining it, but the thing the is... The style matters. I think this... But the, all the, the possibilities the, are real. The projection of the... Um, Apocalypse in the year 2012, I think, is actually damaging of our chances of having a future. No, I think it's a way to manage it. If it's just, it could be tomorrow, it could be 200 years from now, mm. that's a little weird. Why yes. not manage ourselves through a narrow neck in a state of high awareness by, you know, there should be tremendous pressure on governments to get rid of nuclear stockpiles by 2000. Yes, to actually, sure. well, but to use the calendar as a club saying, you know, do you want yeah, to the, enter the, the third millennium the, armed the like of, barbarians? Do you want to be just like King Canute? He was who was in charge at the turn of the last millennium. He <laughs> wants them to hold you up to King Canute and say, Canute Bush, two Viking warlords, two knotheads, or do you want to drape yourself in the olive of peace and be, you know, the savior of the world, the unifier of mankind, and so forth and so on. It's My, a great what thing What I'm suggesting is that mm. the coupling of the apocalyptic vision of the revelation of St. John with uh, the concept of the end of time in the year 2012 makes most likely the response of the Secretary of the Interior, who says, well, so what? I mean, there's nothing we can do about yes, it, so well, let it go. going back to the revelation, John, which I would have, have seen, I could have seen this discussion go on with never a mention of it. I That's see. just an obscure Christian text interesting to fanatics, but the overall world... But the whole idea, this issue. what ideas evoked in people's minds through use of the word apocalypse, our subject here. Well, I called it the end of the world. Good, that's much better. <laughs> it was my notion. That lets John the off the of hook and the, and the yeah, Bible. The end of the world. All right. The proposal of the end of the world <laughs> happening in a fixed year is not inclining people to do something about nuclear stockpiles by the year 2000. Like, who cares if the last 12 years have or do not have nuclear stockpiles? No, I didn't link the two together. I meant that the year 2000... <laughs> Everyone wants to celebrate the millennium by feeling like there's a new style, a breath of fresh air, a new order. So the year 2000, forget 20. Perestroika in the United yes, States. There should be, that would be something. a thorough examination on the part of everybody of their society as we approach the third millennium. That sounds good. That would be a fine thing, I think. You know, it, it's interesting, when they tested the first atomic uh, bomb at Trinity site at Alamogordo, uh, of the 19 physicists who observed it, there were six who believed that the temperatures were high enough to ignite the atmosphere and that the entire planet was in a, uh, there was a 30% chance that the entire planet's atmosphere would be set on fire by this experiment. And they went forward. They had no reason to believe that this wouldn't happen. That would be an interesting experiment. Well, it didn't happen, It be, yes. It's not hot enough. I wonder how that hot That was a close one. That was a close one. And this comet coming back in 2012 looks like a close one. That's the definition of a close one. That's a close one. And the, the, the toxicity... The population the explosion. What about projecting the population explosion to the year 2012? How many people would that be if it continued pace? I don't know. It depends on whose figures you use, but probably approaching 10 billion. 10 billion people. An ozone... 
if you take the ozone hole, which we know that's a problem, propagated at the present rate of phase, there will be no ozone hole. So you've got 10 billion people, no ozone hole. Uh, the impact of that single parameter is totally unknown. Uh, the carbon dioxide emission continues. That's a whole other issue. The yes. acid rain continues. Uh, nuclear proliferation continues. Propaganda runs rampant. Meanwhile, pharmacology, brainwashing, surgical reconstruction, all of this stuff has made new leaps toward great fascist yes. accomplishments. I mean, it's a pressure cooker world that we're describing. And I think under such conditions of cultural compression, forms of novelty will erupt that are totally unpredictable in the present context, and that these are the forces that will create the end of the world. I mean, I think of it sort of like the DMT wave hits the planet or something like that. So much is happening. Everything is knitting together. It cannot be stopped. I mean, there will be cellular technology and human-machine interface and uploading and downloading of clones of people and memories and places and everything. The boundaries are dissolving into some kind of techno-biological informational soup of intentionality. But what is its intentionality? It's not in the hands of any person, any organization, anything we can figure out. It's just the Gaian will, and it's incomprehensible what is happening on this planet. It is like the metamorphosis that goes on inside the chrysalis, except this is a planet that is having its forests liquefied, its oceans boiled, its populations moved, its genes streaming in all directions with all these exotic toxins mixed in. And uh, it has this, it isn't for death that it's well, moving, this, uh, it's moving towards some kind of other thing, not death. Yes, well this is the new, the new Gospel of St. John is, is what you're raving. Gnostic apotheosis. The, the, this is the green version of the apocalyptic vision. That the apocalypse is actually this. This, uh, this is the edge. Poison through the rampant infection of the, of the planet by the human Well, species. but is it poison? I mean, you have to remember that oxygen was a deadly gas that totally destroyed the biotic organization of this planet. And in fact, a billion years was spent responding to the presence of oxygen, yet it is the basis of all present life. Yes. No, I think we're at the I, edge I, I, of I the apocalypse. An apocalypse hurricane. without having the complete sterilization of the planet, something on, the, uh, on that order that took a mere billion years to recover. Disaster. The whole of the evolution. Of, of life on the planet begins uh, again from scratch at the microbial level. That's right. If these asteroid strikes, nothing larger than a chicken. You have to say that, that, that satisfied the original St. John's description of the apocalypse. Yes. So that's it then. <clears throat> the green version, the green reinterpretation of the, of the Bible identifies the present moment as the apocalypse. Oh, I'm sure. It's not even in 2012. We're on the edge it's, of the it apocalypse. It's a time since storm. Since 1847. It's a time storm whose diameter is impossible to estimate, and all we know is that the barometric pressure is dropping faster than you've ever seen it drop, and there's an eerie stillness, and the light in the sky looks very strange, but nothing has happened yet. Nothing it does seem to be yet. out of hand as far as, uh, you know, the scale of something that we could interact with in, in any way. I mean, we're the passive observers of this problem. Well, if we could model it. Well, I, are we the passive observers? I mean, so we are also... magic, you mean? Well, maybe we can prepare. Fractal dynamics, the apocalypse must have its own inner laws and dynamics. This is what we're attempting to do, I assume. Yes, but it also, I mean, before we uh, get into the actual mechanics, the, I think a bit more speculation is called for. <laughs> <laughs> Surely not. <laughs> Assuming that human consciousness doesn't simply become extinguished at death, 
we have the question of what happens when millions of people die together and what happened in Hiroshima when all those people died or in Dresden and the firebomb attacks caused this fireball and a uh, firestorm in Dresden all these people suddenly die together they all pass through the state of the death experience not the near-death experience because this is for real the death experience which from the descriptions we have involves going through a tunnel entering a new kind of realm and a different order of reality rather like the birth canal but into another dimension now however we conceive of what happens at death leaving aside only the materialist hypothesis that all just goes blank um, the end of the world through any of these scenarios billions of people more than ever before dying at once or by the by the million um, is going to create an extraordinary flux of souls, to put it in traditional language, uh, an unprecedented rate of flux, um, an, in, an unprecedented um, passage, and uh, perhaps those who die in the same moment through the same cause undergo some kind of fusion. There may be some kind of um, psychic being uh, of, of kind of humanity. What uh, one way of picturing it in Christian terms is that what's happening to the earth is a global crucifixion. The, hum the whole of humanity is undergoing a kind of crucifixion and there'll be a moment when the, the crucified body of humanity is through the, 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 there's a collective moment at which humanity gives up the ghost or, or at least large sections of it. The nuclear scenario incidentally Ralph, according to its script since the Second World War is essentially meant as the auto-destructive Christendom because all nuclear targets bar those in Turkey which is on in NATO but NATO and Warsaw Pact countries with the exception of Turkey are all Christendom and there's Western Christendom in Western Europe and the United States and there's Eastern Christendom in the Soviet Union and Greece and essentially a nuclear a nuclear thing would be the auto-destructive Christendom which would be very much in the self-fulfilling prophecy mode of you know this particular apocalyptic but the environmental one is much more global it's no longer as we shift from our fo uh, focus of attention to the dangers of nuclear war not that there's any reason to shift from it all the weapons are still there but uh, or as the fashion changes and we turn our attention to the global thing we now see that this isn't just christendom it's everybody um anyway if it does involve everybody then part of the omega point or the thing that terence is trying to uh, describe obviously involves some kind of transition in consciousness which might be achieved through mass death and might be achieved without mass death through something like, that I think Terence rather vividly portrayed on one occasion as being like a kind of collective BMT experience. The um, glory. The glory. You know the, the. I'm not sure that I can explain the glory. It's a ra oh, they also call it the rapture. Fundamentalist. The rapture, lives, yes. And the eminent expectation of this thing that they call the rapture, which will be the opening note of the end of the world scenario. And they're carried up into the heavens in the rapture. They're actually right. born aloft. It's their, a their clothes are left behind as they yes. leave the automobiles going vertically to That's the sky. It. That's yes. the one, the rapture. <laughs> See, it's, it's interesting because we all die. Uh, there is a, an apocalypse built in. It's just that it only happens to you. And so every human life becomes ultimately a, an approach to this question of final time. And what difference does it make that you're the only one that's going to die? After all, that's the one you're standing in. Yes. So it isn't that if you don't live in the age of the end of the world, you don't get to deal with the question of final time. It's just that in this age, the death of the individual and the death of the species are somehow both possible to contemplate. Yeah. And the death of the other species. And the death of the other. It may be, you know, I mean, lots of traditions teach that life is organization for the purpose of creating a kind of after-death vehicle or some kind of structure in a higher dimension which is if carefully made will survive some kind of transition that is potentially uh, could fail and that you're supposed to spend your life doing this well if if the sun were to explode then the entire biological shell of organizational soul 
ecoplasm would be liberated in a fraction of a second, you know. We don't know what life is for or what death is for. Well, I think it certainly makes a difference. The way it certainly makes a difference to the way that individuals face death in what they believe happens to them afterwards. And people who've had near-death experiences, where they've experienced this going through a tunnel, a st altered state of consciousness, out of the body experience, so they have the sensation that there's something in them that leaves the body and survives it. An experience which I think is related to lucid dreaming, which in turn is related to dreaming which is the experience we all have every night, whether we remember it or not, of traveling in other realms with another body, not the same as the physical body in bed, but an implicit body at least. And if the state of being after death is like dreaming without being able to wake up, so that when we die we're captured in a realm of our dreams, we pass through this tunnel and we enter a realm which is more like the realm of dreams than the life of waking experience that there is indeed a post-mortal life in, in such a form, um, a form glimpsed in dreams in some kinds of psychedelic experience where the barrier that's penetrated is maybe like the membrane or the barrier that we penetrate at death, and may, may, they may therefore be akin to near-death experiences, which I think DMT probably is. Um, then, if there is indeed this state of individual survival after death, we have to ask ourselves what would be the state of collective survival if indeed our billions of people were wiped off the earth. Mm -hmm. it, most people don't want to think beyond that moment. It's a catastrophe. We must do everything that we can possibly do to avoid. Uh, and let's start by recycling our beer cans. That's the usual approach. But if you carry it through um, and see what might happen afterwards, uh, vast numbers of people going through this barrier at the same time, collecting a kind of creating a kind of group mind of a, of a kind never before seen in the post-mortal plane, um, possessed of a powerful imagination, perhaps. I mean, if all of them passed through and believed in the New Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem might indeed manifest in this plane, and, and there might be some kind of um, post-mortal state, which is the attractor. The point is that the, the, there are various ways of thinking of, of, of what it is that's drawing people to this millennium both in expectation and in dread. I mean, this is the approach of uh, another metaphor is the, is the last judgment, meeting, meeting God. As Terence put it, like the mind of God coming into history. Um, the the it's a mixture. It's no longer just the loving God, but it's the it's the image of God that certainly has the shadow side in it, because it's the the, the, the it's a dreadful moment. The uh, judgment. Yes. Day of wrath and doom impending, as the DA's era puts it. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting question as to why the apocalypse is such a strong attractor, and the attractor is that somewhere beyond that, all the doom and, and, and this moment, there's some other state of being which is extraordinarily blissful compared with anything we know here, and is utterly more perfect. And it's the same fantasy or dream that was the recovery of Eden, the going to the promised land, the coming to America, the transformation of the world through science and technology. There's something quite magical and infinitely attractive that's motivated the entire historical process. And if, in Terence's view, what we experience is some kind of shock wave coming back from the future, that this thing is hap going to happen, and its approach is sending back these kind of shock waves through time, quite a... <coughs> I mean, a powerful image, I think. This then we have to consider that this, that this, this is what really is happening. It's the blissful state, or, what, or, or whatever this might be, that is actually acting as a historical attractor. It's so powerful an attractor is it that do as we, whatever we do, we can't escape from it once that's been conceived and 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 allowed to infiltrate not just our religion but our entire secular, political, intellect, and scientific and intellectual life. So the justification for the Omega Point concept to, to share down is actually this uh, mechanism built into the apocalypse vision. The Omega yeah. Point is apocalypse. It's 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 the Chardin's conception of the apocalypse, not yeah. just at a human level, but at a cosmic level. Yes. Yes, it happens to all nature. And. Let me just add one more ingredient to this particular line of thought. When we were at Hollyhock recently, Brian Swim came up and was talking about his cosmological views. 
Um, and he was exploring the idea that the universe, like a developing organism, has ages at which things happen. It has an inbuilt cosmological time. It's not like the old universe where galaxies were coming into being, others were dissolving, it just all went on forever in endless cycles. There was a time when atoms came into being first in the universe. There was a time when galaxies formed, or at least the great majority of them. There was a time when planets could form. Planets couldn't have formed a minute after the Big Bang. There was only a time after supernovae had been in existence. Stars had formed in stardust from supernovae. The time when planets could form. So in a sense, just as in a developing embryo, the development has particular times or phases or synchronies. So if there were life on other planets, that the stage it's at might not be that very different from the stage ours is at. So I said to him, this was the most interesting line of thought, and if, since I'd also been thinking about parallel evolution and their possible effect on ours through morphic resonance, interplanetary morphic resonance, similar Gaia's in other solar systems, mm -hmm. planets of the species Gaia will be in resonance with ours, and planets of the species Venus will resonate with Venus, and so on but we're interested in the Gaian resonances. And I said, well, how far, you know, in just sort of rough estimate, order of magnitude in, in time, do you think they'd be from within a billion years of where we are, within a million, within 500,000, within 50, within five? You know, what just where would you put it? He said, just guessing, 50 to 500,000 years of where we are. Mm. So, there might be, you see, similar processes. That's really going. a big bang. I don't understand why he assumes that. Because of this developmental theory of the cosmos. I understand that, yeah. but my guess would be 500 million years. I mean, you have to be reasonable with no, the no, size well, of the universe. Yes, but take into account morphic resonance. If there is indeed morphic resonance between the planets, so that when a new form appears on Earth, it's vastly more likely to appear yes. on other planets. You, you could have a greatly accelerated evolution on other planets till they almost caught up. So if any got in far in the lead, the morphic resonance effect would tend to make the others catch up. It's a I little bit like your time. Work. Yes, it's a cosmic synchronization principle. The next yes. place you can check this is 4.5 light years away, and that may not be suitable. There is a sun-type star in Centauri. 1.1 solar masses. If there were an oxygen-rich, water-heavy planet there, you could. Uh, it could Call be a them twin up. Earth. Call Haven't them up. we been here somewhere before? <laughs> <laughs> this Hello? islander. <clears throat> what are you doing about your apocalypse problem? <laughs> but the thing is, you see that the the Christian apocalyptic vision, the, the vision has several forms. One's the local human one, which just happens to people. Like the Jews going to the Promised Land, it didn't change all nature, it just meant they got other people's vineyards and took over other people's fields and killed the native inhabitants or reduced them to some second-class status. A repetitive pattern in history. And, um, but th this was a limited vision of how, where this whole pr process was lent. It, it, we, then it got more and more elaborated, this apocalyptic vision, until in time of the Chandon, it's the end of the evolutionary cosmos. And it's not just the big crunch, it's much more immediate than that somehow. And so it's this attractor pulling forward, so it's this cosmic vision, but the thing is that it seems to us unlikely, given our standard old-fashioned cosmological view, that anything that happens on Earth would affect the rest of the cosmos. But if lots of Earths are synchronized, and if there are yeah. these, you see, then, then we do indeed begin to get the sense of a possible cosmic apocalyptic. And I don't know yeah. how much well, you've That's heard. an interesting idea. Well, it's it's interesting. Into the cosmic scheme. The, the, the end time of the cosmos. The end of the soul of the world. The course. end of the, the, yes, or the total transformation of the soul of the world. That it may be a maturation process, or that's... You know, because present cosmology hasn't got very much to offer in the way of what happens in the future. Either you've got endless expansion, which seemed persuasive to people in the 1960s when it was generally believed that economies could go on expanding forever and forever. So a cosmos that went on forever. Yes. Then people got worried about the big stock market crashes that all going, the whole thing ending in tears. And then we got more big crunch scenarios on the market. You know, it may, there may be just enough and dark matter. They say it's close to the indeterminate value they can't take. Exactly. And now they've got into a very subtle position, which I'm sure the medieval schoolmen would have admired. 
as a, as a solution to the problem, saying that we're hovering on the very brink between an ever-expanding and ever-collapsing world, so close to the margin that it's impossible ever to tell. Yes. Okay. So, but, you know, these are, these are rather uninteresting visions of, of the future. Well, you've, you've actually created another mechanism for an apocalypse. It happens somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and then by this kind of imploding process, once one pops... It's a chain yeah. reaction. It would be a chain reaction. And the stars yes. would fall from heaven, <laughs> and the lights of the galaxies <laughs> would go out, and uh, that well, would be Well, it's similar to this time travel problem of collapsing time. The future. God Whistle, yeah. The God Whistle. That's yes, right. It's a spatial version of the God Whistle. Yeah. A synchronization of God Whistles, cosmos-wide. Yes, a cosmic chain reaction uh, at a certain developmental stage that just pulls everything down into it. We have to believe that the universe is stranger than we can suppose. Yes. And that's the way by avoiding closure and keeping that in front of us, I think we will not go far wrong. The trouble is that at the apocalypse, if it happens, the hermeneutic cycle will come to an end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it happens in 2012, I'm sure I'll get no credit whatsoever for having been run. <laughs> well, it'd, be, it'd be a bit late for um, credit to be much value to you, wouldn't it? I suppose so. Well, I... I raptural new Jerusalem might have to take its physical existence in another universe. I mean, only this universe will pop. Right? Yes, well, what is it, this new Jerusalem, that everybody leaves this machine of sapphire and emerald and chalcedony that descends from the sky and in which there is uh, you know, a world of delight before the presence of God? I mean, this is the promise. This is the covenant. This is the fulfillment of the covenant. Is too, that of the ocean will boil, everything will be lost, and do not give up the faith, because at the landing of the ark, the covenant was made, not with Abraham, but with Noah, with humanity, and it will be redeemed. There was all this, yes, this, the pledge will be redeemed. The, the promise will be kept. Don't throw away your coupons. They'll be cashed in due time. That's right. The promise will be kept. I think it probably will be kept. Well, I do believe we've transformed the it. apocalypse myth suitable for the purple and green church. You think that we've... Uh... We've transformed it, yes. Yeah. Well, the, the, the green church of Brazil already has a version of the apocalypse myth, which is... Um, they believe in very strongly, and, and they, in theirs, the, the dragon in the last days comes and eats up the forest. They say it's an Inca prophecy, um, and burns and destroys. Um, a dragon, incidentally, which is prophesied at the very beginning of Anglo-Saxon liberal political theory in Hobbes's model of Leviathan, because the dragon that's destroying the Amazon forest is the great monster Leviathan, which society in Hobbes's view, is uh, uh, the aggregate like cells in the body. Individuals are like atoms in the body of the world. Well, there's a dragon in, in the revelation of St. John. Yes. So Our here's... The of heaven crushes the head of the serpent. So here's the serpent, which is... And, and in the last days, the, the, the struggle between the, the, the serpent and the forces of light grows ever more intense people are forced to take sides because it no longer is possible to sit on the fence because the fence itself is crumbling. And there will be an intense polarization through the 1990s, in their view, you know, towards the coming of the millennium because these forces become ever more powerful, preparing for the final battle. Well, this is a, a fairly traditional version of the millennium. This is already one adopted by what one could call a green church. And it's one that... Um, sees the struggle that's going on now as being of uncertain outcome, in a sense. Mm. Uh, although, through faith in the victory over the dragon, the, the victory will be achieved through faith. So, it's another form of seeing faith motivating, faith in some future state, motivating the mm -hmm. struggle. And it's a powerful inspiration. And actually, without some such inspiration, I don't think the Green Movement can function properly. Yeah. And that means that any apocalyptic vision 
that either sees the apocalypse as inevitable mm -hmm. or as something we can't do anything about mm -hmm. is, as you were suggesting earlier, perhaps destructive in its mm -hmm. effect. But an apocalyptic vision which sees it as a process in which we're participants and to which we can make some difference then unleashes this kind of heroic um, heroic archetype. Incidentally, I think that both the conquest of nature and the environmental movements are under the aegis of the heroic archetype. In one of them, uh, the heroes saving humanity from the ravaging powers of destructive nature, like the battle of doctors against cancer. In the other one, the environmentalist is saving the virgin, virgin nature from the onslaughts of, of this destructive dragon of uh, Leviathan, which is devouring the forest, polluting the world, shitting everywhere. Um, so anyway, they're both under this, under this archetype, and maybe it's too late for us to escape that particular heroic archetype either, because the only thing that can motivate the um, green movement is a heroic archetype, whether it takes the form of actual guerrilla fighting, or whether it takes the form of non-violent resistance, a kind of Gandhian and a uh, Christian version which will generate martyrs who will then have this great archetypal appeal. But only some such millenarian faith, I think, could motivate the Green Movement sufficiently fast enough and sufficiently deeply enough to change the scenario. And so I think that we're, this is another way of saying we're so in the fold of this millenarian in, yes. in, in its field that only another millenarian scenario could yes. possibly help undo it. Rubbing it out, getting rid of it, forgetting it, suppressing it, mm -hmm. psychically engineering it out of our psyche, I think we're past all that. Yeah. That's why a jihad to save the earth doesn't sound like a half-bad alternative. From chaos we came and under chaos shall return. The middle name of chaos is opportunity. <laughs> well, well, we have to end somewhere. Yeah.